Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Um, this is a, a guest-led webinar, so I'll be in the chat with you all tonight. Kelly's not here because um, Kelly's busy on placement, but uh, lots of the team are here, as you'll be able to see, looking at the cameras, looking at the panellists. So as you're arriving, please come in, settle down, uh, look at the chat, use the chat. Don't forget if you are using the chat that you can minimize it, you can move it across your screen so that it doesn't interfere with your vision. Um, make sure you set your uh, chat functions to everybody so that everybody can see what you're saying. And as usual, we'd love to know from you where in the world you are, what you're doing, if you're a student social worker, what, uh, what, year are you on if you're a practice educator if you're a team manager tell us who you are what you are in the chat that would be fabulous what we'd really like to know from you though is we're tonight we're going to be looking at i think a really interesting topic friendship and social work so what words would you use to what words would you associate with friendship you know what what words do you use that you would associate with friendship so just think about that just reflect on what words do you associate with friendship? Pop as many of those as you want to in the chat. That would be lovely so that we can see what words each of us associate with friendship. That would be great. Tell us what words you associate with friendship. Fabulous. Look, we're already seeing trust. A lot of trust. I've seen trust a few times in terms of friendship. So uh, if you want to put down in the chat what words you associate with friendship, that would be fabulous. I'm just going to speak just for another moment or two to we've allow everybody time. Oh, sorry, Dave, what were you saying? Just saying we've gone international already. We've gone Albania. Albania? Yeah, I don't Goodness think me. I think that's the first time we've had somebody joining us from Albania. That's great. We uh, we often have international guests, but I think Albania, I think this is the first time for us from Albania. So that's marvellous. Um, thanks for pointing that out for me, Dave. No worries, no worries. Yeah. So I'm going to give it just another minute or two where I chat away and you probably think, what are you chatting? Just chatting away about nothing. But I'm chatting so that when you come in, you know whether your audio is working, because if we were just waiting for people to arrive and it was silent, you'd wonder what on earth is going on. You'd be pressing all your buttons thinking my sound isn't working. So I'm just here to uh, welcome people in, make sure everything's going OK. And then I'm going to really enjoy tonight's webinar and uh, learn from this about friendship and social work which is actually a topic that I think I can't say I've really thought to myself sometimes that friendship's really important at the moment I'm friendship's really important but then the more I've thought about it the more I think gosh this is really important in social work and when I think back to my practice and thinking about working with people who actually very often wanted to have friends involved in their lives or friends became an issue or so I think this is going to be a really interesting um, area for us to learn from tonight so I'm sitting here with my notebook and I'm ready to put everything in for my own CPD. So as our numbers continue to grow, I am just going to hand over to um, Autumn and to Ruth, who are going to introduce themselves. They're going to lead the session for us tonight, which is really exciting. I'm just going to sit back and learn. So welcome to everybody. Um, welcome to Albania. Welcome to everybody who's here and Burnley. Look, I've just seen from Burnley. Marvellous. So thank you uh, very much. I'm going to hand over now to Ruth and Autumn and I'm going to go on mute. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. A really warm welcome. Um, both uh, Ruth and I are in Scotland. Ruth, do you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Ruth Eamond and um, I'm a social worker. I work part of the week um, in a small team called Family Change in Perth um, as a social worker and as a play therapist. Um, and my role there is to support children and families who have had just really difficult times. Um, complex trauma is the kind of defining characteristic, but I think it's easier to think about just children that have had really hard times. And then the other part of the week, I work at the University of Stirling um, and I'm a, a lecturer there in, in social work. So really excited to be here and uh, thank you to Siobhan and to the team for inviting us. So. 
Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so I'm Autumn Resh Marsh, and I work as a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and my background is children and families. I've worked as a school-based social worker, and I worked in residential childcare. But I've been in academia for a wee while now, um, and most of my research is around uh, care experience um, and relationship based practice. Um, and I guess we're really excited to talk to you about friendship. It's something that Ruth and I have been talking about for a long time. I was, my first academic job was at the University of Stirling and Ruth was my mentor, which was fantastic. Um, and I'm really lucky that we became friends and that friendship has endured. Um, so we've kind of um, been talking a lot about what friendship means to us in our lives and also thinking about how it impacts on the people that we work with as social workers and, and why it's so important. Um, and there's a link there, uh, we'll share this at the end, to an article that we, we had published in the British Journal where we tried to bring together quite a lot of the evidence about the importance of friendship and what's known about friendship, particularly for people who've had an experience of the care system. Uh, but tonight we're going to think a little bit more broadly than that. We're going to try and think across social work, uh, the different areas of social work and, and for people in general and any service, why friendship might be important. Um, so um, I'm going to move to the first slide now. Um, so I'll just do that, sorry. Right, so over to you, Ruth. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so we're going to tag team all the way through this, so um, hopefully that will be seamless. But yeah, I suppose what we wanted to do over the next hour was just spend some time with you just thinking about friendship in this context of, of practice. Um, and in order to do that, we wanted to make a space, I suppose, for all of us to think together about the different definitions of friendship and how we understand it. And as I say, to think about why friendship might be important for us in all different uh, areas of, of practice. Um, and, it, and that leads us on then to thinking, well, if we recognise it as important, how do we then actually support friendship? How, how do we um, not just think about it in, in terms of how we are building up a picture of the people that we're supporting, but how do we then help people to feel stronger and more confident in the friendships that they have? Right. Um, so we, we wanted to say a little bit about different definitions of friendship. Um, I suppose, um, it, obviously, it's really important to think about how people themselves define friendship, what it means to them, what their own ideas about what a good friend is, and to have a dialogue with the people that we're working with about that. And, and Ruth and I will say a bit more about how we've done that with people that we've worked with um, and had, had those conversations with children and young people in particular. But I think sometimes it is useful to go back to the philosophers and the sociologists and, and hear how they define it, because it helps us to kind of sharpen our own thinking about it. Um, so philosophy has often tackled the concept of, of uh, friendship and Lynch in particular um, provides a really good overview of, of the etymology of the word. So where did the word friendship come from? How did it develop in the English language? And we have an international group here, so it might be interesting to hear at the end if we have time about different cultures and societies and how they speak about friendship and define friendship in different ways. Um, but Lynch says that it connects its meaning with love and freedom and choice. It's a voluntary relationship that includes a mutual and emotional bond, equal emotional bond, and a, a mutual and equal care and goodwill. Um, as well as pleasure. And I think this idea about um, mutuality and an emotional bond came through in your comments around trust, around kindness, the things that you all identified as being important to friendship. And again, I think when we're working with people, um, helping them unpick, you know, what do they want from a friend and what do they give to others in friendship is really important. Um, and then from a kind of psychological point of view, Blitzner and Roberto talk about it being a voluntary relationship again. It encompasses the idea of intimacy, of equality, of having shared interests, uh, and pleasurable or a need-satisfying interactions. And again, it could be very important when we're working with people who maybe their friendships aren't that 
a positive thing in their life to try and think about the positive side of friendship and what that means to them and see if they can find people that will will be more supportive and more positive in their life. Um, and then it's and then the, the sociologist, as usual, kind of help us to step back a bit further. And Heathy and Davies say it's really important to take an open ended approach to thinking about friendship friendship and, and recognize the diversity and the multidimensionality of friendship as it's lived. You know, so some people will talk about kin relationships as friends. They'll say my sister's like my friend or my mom's like my friend. Um, and it's really important to think about these kind of crossovers and definitions um, and also that there can be this dark side of friendship, which sociologists have begin to, begun to write more and more about. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Ruth. Yeah, so I guess when we were thinking about that, I suppose the, the abstract sort of academic definitions of, of friendship, they're, they're useful for us to grapple with. But I guess as practitioners, where we always want to start with um, is the understanding and the, the approach that the people we're supporting have of whatever issue it is. So in relation to friendship, we want to be curious about well, what does friendship mean to you um, as this person I'm starting to get to know and to think about how I may, might best support. Millie and Evelyn just do this incredible job of talking about their friendship. They met in a, a, a nursing home um, and their sense of connection that they had almost immediately um, and the friendship that they had kind of developed, um, I suppose it really struck a chord with me because it really got me thinking about these definitions that Autumn was talking about, that in a way we can sort of summarise those by just thinking about the importance of connection. And that definitely came up in the chat as people were um, putting forward their suggestions about what friendship meant, that sometimes with, with friends, there's almost like an immediate sense of connection and we recognise something in each other um, that allows a, a depth of a relationship to, to, to flourish. And I guess what Millie and Evelyn were talking about was for them, the context of the nursing home um, played a big part of, in their friendship that they were having an experience together. Um, and the sense they made of that deepens their relationship with one another. Again, for, for them, friendship had had to take um, the sort of place of family. So they had really restricted access to family. And I think that that's been a huge issue for so many of us over the last couple of very difficult years. But I guess particularly when we're thinking about people who have had access restricted. So either because they've been in nursing home care or residential care, um, or prison, like, you know, that, that um, lots of the people that we're supporting as social workers will have had very restricted access to, to their family connection. So friendship takes on an even, an even greater kind of feature. Millie and Evelyn also are able to think about the kind of skills required in being a friend. But it's not necessarily straightforward and you have to think about how you navigate and negotiate, how you listen, how you respect, um, and how you sort of accept. So it's a really lovely video if um, if you get the chance to, to watch it. Okay, awesome, back to you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so, so I guess, um, you know, the first philosopher who wrote about friendship was Aristotle, and, and he, really talked about this idea of the virtuous friendship. So um, the friendship of virtue, he says, um, this is a, a kind of friendship that again is characterized by mutuality and equality. And it requires, he says, time and familiar familiarity, um, which is something that sometimes the people that we work with don't have a lot of, and it's something a lot of us haven't had um, the time to spend with each other recently. Um, 
but but he also says we cannot admit admit each to friendship or be friends until each has been found lovable and been trusted by each. So even in ancient Greece, these ideas of lovability and trust and also relate um, acceptance of ourselves are kind of understood to be important from friendship. And when Ruth and I were talking about this presentation, um, Ruth shared um, a really lovely metaphor about this idea of boxes that one of her friends um, shared with her which is this idea that one of the challenges of friendship is, is to identify the different types. Um, you know, some friends like Aristotle say are friends that you, you know, you play with or you party with or, you know, they're the good time friends where and they go in the good time friend box. Other friends are people that you would really call when you're in a crisis, when you're in, in a dark time and you could really trust and, and you have a deeper relationship with those kind of people. And that one of the challenges is, is recognizing the who your friends are and the different friends in your life and understanding which box they go in. Because if we expect the good time friends to be there for us in a crisis, um, we're probably going to get disappointed. So it's that skills of discernment and judgment about who to be trusted and how to make the most of the friends we have and what they, they have to offer, because not everyone can offer the same things. And that's something I think that we can help the people that we work with to think through and reflect upon and also think about the type of friend that they want to be to other people. Um, so Ruth, I think you were going to say just a little bit more about that in terms of quality of friendship and depth. Yeah, so I guess sometimes for in practice, I'm just thinking about my own practice, that sometimes what I've, I've um, tried to do with, particularly I'm thinking about young people, um, is to try and help them to think about that idea of boxes, because sometimes People can be so hurt and uh, so upset by the reaction of friends or the expectation they might have of friendship and then being let down by that. Or maybe um, trusting people with really intimate kind of private information about themselves and then that sort of being exposed. So helping people really with that skill of discernment, I guess, to try and work out the layers of friendship, that these boxes that we might want to fit our friends in, are they people we want to keep close and that we trust? Or actually does this friend still, is important, but needs to move further out into a different different layer, different um, box of, of friendship. Interestingly, um, today I was on a call with a, a kinship carer and one of the things that she was talking about was how hard it is for her in her friendships to, she's a granny and she's caring for two quite young children. And she's saying, you know, my friends are, are doing, they're living a different life now. You know, they're kind of, they have lots of free time and they're, 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 they're yeah, just living a different life. And so it's really adding to her kind of sense of isolation. And so in some ways that, sense of disconnect from friendship can be as important for us to recognize and to think about how can we try to replace that or try to um, support someone with letting their friends know um, how they're feeling and how they're experiencing their friendship at that point in time. So it's a really, uh, really important thing, I suppose, for us to understand the quality of friendship and and why that might matter and how it might change over time. We're going to think a bit more about that. But I guess um, we also wanted to think almost about the layers of friendship. And all of you will have friends and you'll probably relate to this. But again, just thinking about the sort of surface level friends and the sort of deeper level friends. So Hartup and Stevens, they talk about this kind of deep structure of friendship and um, fundamental to that is this notion of reciprocity so we give and receive from each other so it's not just that I tell you my sort of worries and my dark kind of secrets but you tell me yours too like we share that and we connect with each other over that um, and that surface structure maybe relates more the kind of exchanges and sort of everyday interactions but 
all of that cake, if you like, all of that mixture is unique. So our ingredients for friendships will be unique to us. And again, as practitioners, we really want to try and understand that uniqueness, that cake, what does it look like for the, for the people that we're working with? And how does it change? How does it ebb and flow over time? So how might the, the levels of reciprocity change over time? So, you know, how do we support people to be there for one another when, when they're needed most? Um, so all of those things take skill and take experience. And so often we're having to really support people with with that, with thinking about the, the skills of, friend, of friendship. So will we move on, Autumn? I'm actually <laughs> shivering, I'm so oh, cold. No, really. I've got my cardigan on. Okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> what I should so, have done before this seminar is switch <laughs> my heating on. <laughs> I think this is the menopause. I'm boiling, <laughs> then I'm freezing. Sorry about that. Oh. There was so, a session on that. Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah. I know, we need a session on yeah, <laughs> Ruth's menopause, never mind menopause generally. So, yeah, friendship, why is it important? So I guess we know that the, the landscape of relationships is hugely influenced by context. And boy, do we know it in the last couple of years, the extent to which the pandemic restrictions, all of these things have massively influenced um, our experience of relationships and our being with other people. But there's a sort of bigger contextual change, I guess, that's occurred in relation to global movement. So the fact that Autumn and I are friends that met in Stirling when she's from the States um, <laughs> and has family there, and I know desperate to have visit from her mum. Um, so we, we move around the world now in a way that we just didn't 50, 60 years ago. Um, and we're all doing that. So families are increasingly kind of fragmented socially. And I think what research is showing us is that what's happened as a result of that is that in adulthood, friendships are taking on more and more of a kind of familial function. So we look to our friends to help with childcare, <laughs> um, to bail us out practically, financially, emotionally, in ways that maybe we would have called on family or extended family in the past. We're more and more fragmented. But we also have a freedom because we all know that not family isn't necessarily a source of support. Family can also be a source of real pain and real tension. So friendships can become a kind of family of choice. You know, we can say, well, actually, I don't get what I need from my family, but I can create a family-like structure. I have a choice to, to be able to do that. Um, and I think that that has been a hugely influential experience for people that have had very difficult families, that they feel there are opportunities to make relationships that they can rely on. Um, through friendship. One of the really interesting things, I suppose, is also maybe the change in how we're understanding friendship. So particularly in relation to children and young people, there's been a focus on peer relationships and nine times out of 10, that's really been around sort of bully victim kind of dichotomies and not necessarily recognizing that children and young people are fabulous friends, can have the skills and capacities to be really good friends to one another um, in a way that can be life-changing. So for some young people, it is their friends who have kept them going. It is their friends who help them feel connected and, and feel joined with others. So I think we're starting to recognize much more um, the role that friendship plays. And again, similarly, um, as the video um, would have shown you, I guess thinking about older age too, that we're recognising friendship through a life course and really recognising where friendship might feature at different stages in our life. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. The other well, thing I just wanted to say, sorry, yeah. just before we move slide, is just, um, I guess the other really interesting thing, which I hadn't been aware of or thought about until, I guess, Autumn and I started having these conversations, was there's some really interesting research, particularly from kind of social psychology, that argues that some children and young people um, are part of the function of friendship in childhood and youth. It's almost a rehearsal for intimate kind of adult relationships. So we learn about boundaries, we learn about who we are in relationships and how we set limits, how we um, begin and end relationships, that we kind of rehearse that sometimes through through our friends relationships that we then can take into our more intimate kind of personal relationships in in adulthood so again there's something for me about and um, the importance that we give this experience of friendship and how we how we recognize it sorry that's no 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 in the next slide is you as well i was just gonna the one thing i was gonna add which i think i forgot to put in the notes is just this huge and growing literature about loneliness and the impact that that has on our health and some studies have shown that you know being lonely can have as much of a detrimental impact on our physical health as as smoking um so it really matters kind of social contact and, and friendship really matters for, for outcomes, uh, physical and mental health outcomes as well, which I'm sure everyone here will be kind of recognized instinctively, even if you haven't read that research. But sorry, Ruth, back to you for, for changing no, discourses. <laughs> no, I think that's, it's really helpful to be reminded of that. And again, I suppose I'm thinking about that carer today, you know, that, that it's, it's having such an impact on her that she doesn't have these relationships that normally she relies on and they're not just about support, they're about recognition, being seen, mm. being heard, having fun, um, having escape, that all of those doors feel a bit shut to her just now. So, yeah. So, yeah, so summarising that kind of changing structure, there are also changing discourses. So we've moved from this notion of family as local and stable and accessible to thinking much more about the complexity of family. There's a greater recognition, I think, that families come in all different shapes and sizes um, and come with lots of different challenges. So I think we're, there's definitely a, a change in how we think and talk about family. It's much more accepted now than perhaps it was previously. I think we're also moving away from this notion of independence and thinking much more of life as interdependent. <laughs> There's no, none of us who are independent, that we need no one and nothing. So I think we're getting much better at thinking about interdependence and, and when we're supporting families or we're supporting individuals to think about who, who are they connected to and who do they give to? And um, so again, sometimes I think in practice, we don't always pay attention to what service users are giving and offering to other people. We quite often focus on the deficits and the things that people are lacking in, not necessarily recognizing what they do for others. We're also living longer. So again, there's a change of discourse that friendship isn't necessarily confined to children, that we're thinking much more about friendship through a life course sort of perspective and the role that friends play as, as we age and as we, we live longer. Um, and finally, I think there's something about the impact of technological change. So it allows us to stay connected in ways that we didn't before. So even thinking about the telephone wasn't around in my grand's age. So when her childhood friends moved away that was kind of it it was letters and that was that was as far as it could go so we're able to keep connections in ways that we just didn't have before but equally we have challenges then in terms of the sort of Facebook friend kind of culture so is this a real friend is this what what kind of is the quality of of this relationship when it's done 
completely virtually? Can it be? Can it be the same? So thinking back to those boxes again, sometimes certainly with the families I work with, um, they've placed friends in the wrong box, and that's where the kind of heart and confusion has has come from. Mm -hmm. okay, Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so, so uh, we wanted to think with you next a bit about a little bit more about the importance of friendship and context and lots of different sociologists have written a lot about this um, in really helpful ways. Um, and Adam and Alan talk in particular about kind of mapping out the different structural uh, impacts uh, on friendship and how how these structural and contextual things impact on what our what our opportunities are for making and keeping friends um, and and also Cronin more recently has talked about the impact of other relationships on our opportunities for friendship so you know many of us will meet people through other people you know so if someone is not doesn't have a, a job, for example, is unemployed, and what are the opportunities to kind of meet people through work networks and, and widen their social networks? Or equally, if you're at college or at university, you know, you meet people through other people and, and how those people that you meet impact on the other friendships that you have. So the quality of of your current friendships can impact on other relationships as well. So we want to talk a little bit more about the different ways that the context can shape friendship, because I think if we're looking to help people um, find and keep these positive reciprocal friendships that can make all the difference to their mental health, to their physical health, and to their happiness and their overall well-being, then we need to think about the different contexts that either support and enable or maybe get in the way. Um, so first off, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, just structural um, friendship and the en enablers and barriers within structure. So I just mentioned about work settings. Um, and obviously, there are certain work contexts where there's more opportunity to chat and be with people and we've all experienced firsthand working from home what is lost you know all those chats in the corridor at the photocopier or in the common room um going from one meeting to the next that we, we don't get anymore um and so the chance to get to know people better and deepen and and maybe develop friendships or maintain those um has been interrupted by the fact that we're just not physically together um uh, but also the way we work can interrupt that. So um, in Scotland, we're seeing some of our social work authority teams, even before the pandemic, had closed offices and people were working remotely, often working from their car with a mobile phone. Um, and again, the way that, that the structures of working life can become a barrier to people connecting and making friends. Um, also educational settings. And again, we've seen this, I mean, I've really found it so hard to see students suffering through a lack of, of opportunity to connect with each other because they can't kind of have that chat before the lecture or after the lecture they're not able to just go for an impromptu coffee and get to know people and make friends and it's really you know it's had a really Im an impact and that's that's changed because the structure of education has changed so we've kind of all lived through the impact of these structural things and how they can impact on you know opportunities or barriers to friendship um, but also care policies and practices and in our, our British Journal article Ruth and I talk about you know some of the risk averse policies and practices in certain places can place barriers to children and young people in the care system for example maintaining friendships if they move placement or making new friends um, and so we really need to think about you know if, if someone is is surrounded by services if they're in kind of what we sometimes deem service land and a lot of the people in their lives are paid to be there how those structures can really limit the opportunities to make and keep friends um, and also just access to activities, again, where they might find people with common interests. Um, and then your social capital in general, we often, as I said, meet people through other people or, um, you know, I, I, for example, when I was a teenager, you know, I actually became friends, quite friendly with some of my mom's friends, and they were kind of like older sisters and 
friends to me. And that was really important at certain points in difficult points in my adolescence. Um, and then obviously community membership. And we all know that some neighborhoods are just um, more inclusive and provide better opportunities because of what's available, um, you know, cafes and drop in centers and things places where people might meet each other and, and become friends. And obviously, religion can be a really important space for creating and supporting friendship. Um, so, so yeah, it's really important to think if we want to have an impact on friendship, where are the opportunities? Where are the barriers for people um, to make to make friends? Um, and also, it's important to think about culture and friendship. Um, um, and I, I really like this picture of these these women um, I think they're Amish women um, uh, do, making a quilt together. And I think the, the photo was probably taken in the 1940s. Um, and again, this idea of, you know, cultural practices that bring people together where you know, women would be working on this over a series of weeks and they'd be chatting and singing and spending time together and, and how different cultural practices might enable friendship to grow and thrive, um, but also might you know, present barriers. So this was obviously very gendered activity. These, these women probably weren't necessarily having a lot of male friends and that might not have been a kind of acceptable thing in that in that culture at that time so you know thinking about what the norms and roles are in the cultural context and and how that creates or limits opportunities for friendship um, and and what your in is with that um, and 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 yeah and also kind of narratives and stories around what friendship is and what it means um, and I was really lucky when I was in high school I was really um, privileged to get the opportunity to travel in the Middle East a bit and I went to Syria and and also to Kuwait and and spent quite a few months there trying to learn Arabic which I was terrible at I hasten to add um, but I was really really struck by the way that because the genders were more divided, the, it, the kind of the the bonding that I found among among the women that we lived with and stayed with, I found it at such a, a depth, depth and a warmth that was very different to my American um, minority world perspective on friendship. And it was just had a very different quality and the singing and the dancing and um, all of this uh, was just so rich and seemed these practices really supported the development of friendship among the women that I lived with. Um, so again, it's just really important for us to, to, to think about the cultural context of the people that we work with and where are the stories and the practices of friendship fostered in, in those settings um, as well. Uh, Ruth, I think you were going to talk a bit about the spatial aspect. Yeah, so I guess, um, I guess it's, it's a really interesting one for me thinking about where where are the spaces that friendships get created and and get sustained? Um, Autumn had kind of found this picture in a way. It I think it's amazing because it's um, that way in which children find find fun, like they find fun in spaces. <laughs> they find ways to be together, and um, sometimes as adults, what we don't notice that what we notice is the sort of bleakness around um, and we pay attention to, like as I was saying, the deficits. We look at like the poverty or we look at the neglect in this picture potentially, but what we miss is the fun and what we miss is the kind of connection. Um, and what that means then when we remove children from what to us might seem a very bleak landscape, but to the children, their place, their sense of connection to one another and to, to place. So I think, yeah, so I think friendship is influenced by environment. It's, it's shaped and, and like all of us, shaped by the spaces that we inhabit. Um, for some of the families that we work in, those spaces become really limited. So physically where we're allowed to move around to or where we have access to can be relatively restricted. Um, but equally, we can take people and put them out of place, out of space, which makes friendship making even more difficult because there is a disconnect for, for, for those people in that particular context. It's not one that feels familiar. So people don't necessarily feel their best self or feel their most confident self um, to, to create those new relationships. I think the other thing is sometimes like you see friendships um, 
being used to kind of claim a space or reclaim a space. So, you know, if you look in any kind of school playground, you'll see how children inhabit different areas of the playground or different areas of the school. And with that comes particular meaning. So if you're in a particular spot in the playground, that means you're in the cool group or then you're not in the cool group or you're in the hide from all the scary people group or yeah I had a funny I had a wee boy today this morning who was telling me about um never going to the football pitches because that's where like the trouble starts so his way of managing in school is to keep away from those places and because mm. he does that he ends up having friendships with other people who are also trying to avoid those conflict spaces or those more dangerous spaces. So sometimes places help us find connection, find the others, <laughs> find the other people like us. Um, so again, I suppose as practitioners, being alert to that, thinking about where are the spaces that people are inhabiting or moving around in, and is that something that's helping create friendships or is it something that's blocking the friendships that people want to have or, or want to to nurture. And I think that's particularly the case when, again, across the lifespan, when we're thinking about um, having to support people into a transition. So whether that's a child having to move to a different place to live away from their family, or whether that's an older person having to move into to residential care, or somebody who's been given a custodial sentence, like these points of transition, friendships are often the things that are completely overlooked in terms of when we're understanding the impact of that change, um, but often can be the most profound for people. So just thinking, I suppose, about how space and location um, is recognised as an enabler or as a, as a barrier. Okay yeah. To move on. yeah, no, I, I was just the other thing I was just going to say real quick, Ruth, is what I another thing I love about this photo is just there's just that, you know, there is this something innate in all of us to connect and to play. And that's part of being human. And it's so it's such a beautiful quality that's in everyone. And to kind of reach for that in our practice, you know, um, you know, so I just love the picture kind of speaks to that to me a little bit sorry um but back to you Ruth for no, this one right, right. so yeah I guess the other thing is to think about these temporal enablers or barriers so thinking about how our needs change over time so what we need from friendship at one point or in our life may be really different than what we need at later points in our life um and also I suppose thinking back to that idea of context and connection we change over time and so we we connect with different types of people so all of you connecting through this amazing network it's happened at this point in your life because you've chosen to do train in this area or work in this area 10 years ago 15 years ago you may not have connected or felt a sense of connection so I think recognizing our needs change but also the time and the point we are in life enables and creates different opportunities for us in terms of, of friendship. So yeah, I'm just thinking that um, like for me, I, I kind of had another wave of, of new friends um, when I had my son. I met all these other women that um, were also in a complete panic about having a new baby and knowing what to do and not to do. And that kind of sense of vulnerability I think connected us in a way that has endured even though our children are teenagers now we still have that sense of connection because we remember being vulnerable <laughs> and being there for each other at that time and that those opportunities happen all the way through life but again in practice it's thinking about how alert are we to that that, that people might need different types of friendships at different different points and how do we enable that um, to happen. Okay. Brilliant. So, um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. But Ruth, and I'm just really aware of time too, yeah. Ruth, so we might have to fly a bit through this final bit. Yes, that's fine. So, yeah, so I guess when we're thinking about us as practitioners, 
what we're suggesting, and it is a suggestion because we've got no research evidence to support this, so just from our musings, I guess we think that friendship work, paying attention to friendship, should feature through all of these different stages, which look like a nice neat line, but you'll know, move backwards and forwards and round about and upside down. So, but paying attention when we are assessing, when we're building up a picture of families or building up a picture of an individual, are we asking questions? Are we curious about friendship? Do we think about it? Um, and then also thinking about, can you go back? Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. And then thinking about the sort of planning stage of our work. Um, so when we're making plans with people, are we are we factoring in access to their friends? Are we planning in, uh, um, counting in like what friendships might offer, but also what our service user is offering to his or her friends that we need to make sure they still have space to do um, in our plan making. Um, and equally then in our, in our intervention, are we, thinking about friendship as potentially a source of support, um, but also as, or something that needs to be supported. Do we need to help someone with the skills around friendship or the changes they're experiencing in relation to friendship? Um, yeah, and then equally in terms of review, I, I, I have, well, I've been in social for nearly 30 years and so many times, people have wanted their friends at the meeting. They don't really want a family member, they want their good friend at that meeting. And how accommodating are we of that, of that um, need? You know, I would want my friend there, so do we support that? So are we thinking about friendship all the way through these different stages? So thinking about assessment, I saw in the chat, there was some lovely discussion there about equal maps. And this is a map that, um, a young woman that I'm working with just now, I was telling her about doing this session and she had done this amazing little equal map for me um, or with me um, around her friends. So she's happy for me to share it with you um, this evening. But this is her map of, of um, her friendships. So she selected for herself, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, I haven't got a pointer, but the little blue dot um, plastic one, the circle with the four dots, that's it, awesome, yeah. And up above that, that's her two best friends. These are her two best friends. The one down to the left there, the fluffy ball, this is a friend who's a boy um, and she's been friends with him since she was really young, but she kind of keeps him kind of hidden because he's a boy and it's a bit <laughs> embarrassing it's not good to have a friend that's a boy at the moment where she's at and then over to the right the big button is a sort of pretty kind of cool girl I suppose that she's kind of feels she might be friends with but she has these sort of little buttons underneath who are her the big buttons kind of close pals so the cool girl's in her stratosphere, but there's a bit of distance. And then the eye at the top, which I think is an amazing <laughs> uh, choice, that's the sort of really dominant bully, basically, in the class who my girl experiences as keeping a, basically a beady eye on everybody. Um, but she wanted her in her friendship map, I think partly because she was frightened about not putting her on it. Um, and what that would mean. She needs to keep this girl in sight, but equally feels very much in scru under scrutiny from her. So I like to do equal maps like this. I know people do them with, you know, drawing and they do them with lines and things. I, I like to do them like this because I'm always interested to see where someone places themselves. So the first button I always ask, pick something for you. I like to see where they then situate themselves. So for this girl, she's kind of at the edge almost. She's not in the center of her world yet. And um, hopefully we'll get her to feel much more a center of, of, of her world. But I like using buttons because we can move them around. So as we sort of start to think and talk a bit more, 
we can wonder what would it be like if, if you were there rather than there, or if we change that I button to a different button, what would that feel like? So I like, I like the buttons, I like moving them around, and I always, always have a jar of buttons in my bag. Um, that's been a thing that's got me through many a conversation with people. Um, it's a really handy, you probably do this anyway, but it's a handy, handy thing to have. So sometimes when we're exploring things, these are some of the questions we, we might ask about, just like, tell me about your friendships or tell me about what does it mean to you? What would your friends say about you is always a great question to ask because what you get isn't just what friends would say, but often how people see themselves. Um, and then asking about who you like to spend time with or who you tell your worries to and who do you have fun with. And I guess that starts to help us to think about that idea of boxes again. So who's in that really close to you box and who's in the kind of further away, maybe fun, fun box. So anything visual I think is always really helpful. And I've used boxes and um, you get brilliant ones in Ikea. I don't know if you still get them, but the, you know, they're like tiny and, and then you get bigger and bigger, like Russian dolls, but boxes. I use them a lot for these kind of things and my buttons a lot. Um, just to, to try and explore these different views and experiences that, that people have. But there are much more formal tools. So Furman's peer assessment tool is one that, that has a list of kind of very particular questions that you can try and assess the quality and the sort of extent of, of friendships. So thank you to my girl for sharing, letting us see her picture. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Um, and I mean, so moving on from what Ruth was saying about bringing it into your assessment, really understanding all these bits about who who friends are, who the friends are, and, and, you know, the different types of friends, and then thinking about in your planning work, um, you know, obviously we're thinking with people about, you know, what do they want? What outcomes are they looking for in their life? What are their dreams? What are their hopes? What are their wishes? What kind of things, you know, what that's that kind of magic question we sometimes ask people in solution of focus practice, you know, um, kind of really getting a, a picture of what that, what a different world life could be like and what people really are hoping for. And, and, and does friendship and connection with people feature? Because in my experience, it often does. Um, and that's backed up in the research. People often say um, when they're asked about what a good life is, um, what a happy life is, it's, it's about having friends and family. Family, um, and having connection with people. Um, so incorporating that into the planning and thinking, okay, if, if people are wanting more friends or a friend or a better quality friends, um, you know, how can we help them with that? Um, how can we maximize the opportunities? So thinking about the different contexts, where that might grow, where that might flourish, where that might be supported, um, and who might might help with this and and Ruth and I have thought a bit about this in terms of you know the roles that carers and parents can play in in helping children to make friends you know it's the play dates you often think of and how important those are and ferrying children to different activities and and to really helping them connect with the children and the people that they want to that they want to be close to that they want to get to know um uh, enabling that as much as as we can and enrolling other supporters as well in that um so again i've seen that with you know with foster carers um networks of foster carers trying to support each other's foster children to make friends and to to think about how they can work together to support the context for that and enrolling people into into that um to that support supporting friendship role um and also then you know thinking as well about specific interventions that might relate to friendship work in different ways um and try to so for example it might be partly about trying to target the barriers to friendship and you know advocating for people who who maybe because of structural things are not getting the opportunities to meet people to engage to make friendships and um you know their rights to connection um i've been doing a lot of work recently on um social media and digital rights and again the importance of being able to to 
to have those online connections, um, obviously trying to keep those safe and help young people understand how to protect their privacy. But that's a really important way now that young people connect with each other and make and keep friends. Um, so kind of thinking about those things, um, I've already men mentioned the bridging and the building of social networks and social capital, but there's also a lot of writing on friendship training and friendship work and social skills development, particularly in the, the disability field. There's been a lot of work on kind of what parents can do kind of programs of support to help young people develop skills around empathy and reciprocity and um, talk, but a lot of the things we would do anyway about recognizing feelings in ourselves and others all of these things can really help with um, children and young people and adults de developing friendships um, I think there's more I could say on that but I'm aware we only have five minutes so I'm gonna I'm gonna press on um, because we wanted to kind of make a, a point here at the end as well about the importance of friendship as a social worker. Um, some of the best friends I made were on my social work training and I couldn't have got through the course without them and they, they continue to be my, my friend and friends and supporters. Um, so just thinking for yourself, reflecting a bit for yourself on who do you go to for support? Um, who, who comes to you with their worries? Who helps you to keep your morale up? Um, and who challenges your thinking as well, because good friends will often help us see the world in different ways and, and help us progress and de develop. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything ab about that, Ruth. Yeah, I think I, I think that's a great point. I think, um, yeah, when we were talking about this session, we were saying actually friendships can sometimes be incredibly difficult and really challenging. And probably all of you will have had moments with friends where yeah, you, you, you're you kind of tearing your hair out and thinking, actually, I do not need this in my life. Um, so I think um, sometimes we can think about friendship in this really positive way, but actually friendship, like all relationships, can be hugely complex. I think just, I suppose for me, there's been huge learning um, when I've started to work in this area and think about this area of my assumptions, I suppose, about friendship and what a friend is and how friendship should be done so again it's that lesson and practice that I keep getting um, that I need to start with who my I hate the words but service user what what are they thinking about this what's their take on what a friend is what does it mean to them because honestly you know uh, yeah I'm thinking a, a wee boy I've just finished working with he made loads of friends gaming and my initial reaction was, you can't have proper friends on a gate. Like, how can that be? But actually, you know, it extended into meetups and, you know, people that he kind of knew in school, but they connected over games. Um, so I think I had lots of learning to do. So I suppose it's just keeping that openness to always starting from, uh, from that point. Yeah, that curiosity and being open to learn about what, in this context, what does friendship, what does friendship mean? So, um, Ruth, I can see that there's a couple people with their hands up. So I oh. wonder if I should stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. And if we have a moment to take a couple of questions, I don't know what our moderators think of that idea. I will, but if that's okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. Okay. Hello. Nice to see. <laughs> I couldn't see anyone's faces. I was just talking to my computer, which just makes you feel slightly disoriented hello it's nice to see everyone's faces again <laughs> I think um, sometimes autumn when people put their hands up it's so they can say yes you can yes you can I think so when Ruth was saying I was thinking you can't make friends on gaming I think people were probably oh, putting yeah, their hands yeah. up to go yes you can <laughs> I have I think that might be and oh, actually they've just put their hands up again so I'm thinking that oh, might be the case it okay. could be the case <laughs> But we could have some questions. We can ask people to put questions into the chat now and raise, um, and you know, I'll bring those questions to you. But just whilst we see if there are any questions, I think there were a couple of things that for me being in the chat came out. Tonight. One was about when you were talking about everybody wants to play. 
fascinating that when Ruth's button thing came out, the, the chat just lit up. It was just like, <laughs> this is amazing. I want buttons. I want. Aww. And then we started talking about Lego and stickle bricks and the things you can use to yep. create that. And it, it that really lit up, you know, Aww. and um, seeing that, seeing. And because I'd been talking earlier about eco maps, you then I didn't know you were going to show an eco map. Ah. With later. So that that was um really interesting um but from my perspective i you know feel it's really challenged my thinking tonight actually because but i also think there were so many things that to me really started to make me think about friendship and social work and the links but then i was also thinking but when you're a really hugely busy social worker and you've all these targets to meet and you've got this to do in this time and that to do and you've got to meet these indicators friendship's not there it's not there as an indicator it's not there as a box on the form it's not there as so we've got a responsibility to bring that in and we've got to help people to recognize that and there were as you were talking you know I was going back over my 31 years 32 years as a social worker and then four years as a student social worker so 36 years on this journey and it's so many things were popping up for me thinking well that was really relevant to that and that was really relevant to that so it's so relevant but I think lots of people maybe don't see the relevance in in friendship and social work so I think tonight has been for me really useful it's really made me think I know this is a webinar that I'm going to think about over the next few days and I'm going to think about how does that connect and what can we do about that so and people are raising their hands it normally means when they're raising their hands they're agreeing so I don't know if that means that people <laughs> are agreeing with what I'm saying because they're not raising questions I think they're um if you have got a question don't raise your hand put it in the Q&A box or put it in the chat um, that's the thing to do uh, normally in our sessions people raise their hands to agree or to say yeah here that's an issue here or something so um, thank you for for saying that though about the the forms because I think I think that again has been a big bit of learning for me is sometimes there is a need to put aside the form and put at the centre the human being. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about an assessment, fundamentally that is about building up a picture of what it's like to be that person, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think if we kind of start with that question, then friendship falls naturally. Like if someone was going to ask me about who I am in my life, I, I, I couldn't answer that question without talking about my friends. But, but I think if we're guided all the time by the forms, then we kind of lose the humanity of it. Like we forget that services are us. We are, we are them. We are people. And the humanity gets, gets kind of tangled up. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we have, to, we have to meet all of those objectives from a system legal point of view. But I think sometimes starting with those kind of questions what's important for me to know about you like to help me kind of understand how it is for you just now then those kind of open questions they help people to tell tell me about the people that are important to you um, absolutely uh, some because some for many people friends are more important than family yeah. aren't they and yet we ask don't ask about family and don't yeah. you know because we directly ask sorry we do, yeah do these genograms but we don't it could be utterly meaningless if you yeah. have no relationship yeah. with your family and you have no contact with them you can have a lovely um whose life is it anyway or whatever that show is but actually it doesn't tell us anything yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was I was just going to say I was picking up on something in the chat about the relationship to ourselves and how important that is for friendship and I think that's one of the things that some of the young people I worked with in the past have really struggled with because they they don't feel very confident in themselves and they haven't had a lot of positive feedback in their lives about themselves and so um it, it makes it hard to risk and kind of know how to approach other people. And, and they feel, you know, they can feel really hit when they, they feel it's rejection. It can hit them very deeply and throw them off course, maybe then more than you would think, you know, so trying to kind of understand, understand that, that relationship with self and self-esteem and friendship and, and also the friendship stories, you know, because um, I've also heard kids talk about, you know, say nobody likes me or I'm, I'm not somebody who anybody wants to be friends with. And so there's already sometimes from a quite a young age a narrative of this is not something I'm good at. Nobody likes me and kind of trying to think about 
how we can kind of challenge that or give opportunities for children and young people to have different experiences of themselves in social settings that maybe start to shift that narrative a little bit. Um, and, and small things can make a really big difference too, um, as well. Like I remember one boy that I was working with who, um, you know, he's really into uh, Scottish dancing and he moved into care and that had all kind of fallen by the wayside. But the foster care and I really advocated for extra funding for him to restart that. And it was like everything was kind of starting to veer off course and getting back into that and reconnecting with some of his dancing pals. It did genuinely make all the difference. It was a big, big turning point, which maybe that seems like something simple, but it was it was so important because that was his that was one point of connection that he could kind of still hold. Um, yeah. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just yeah. wrote something else in the chat. So just wanted to thank the person who talked about it's scary to make friends. And I think fantastic for putting that in because, again, I think there's an assumption that everybody knows how to do it or that you feel good about doing it. And at different points in your life, it can feel much, much more intimidating and quite frightening. And again, I don't know that necessarily we are tuned in to that. So thank you to the person who put that in. It's really helpful. And I think as well, things like, you know, you were talking earlier Autumn, about those transitional moments. I know there's a lot of pressure on, say, students who are going away from home for the first time, perhaps to university, being told, oh, that's where you'll make the friends that you'll have for the rest of your life. And actually, it's really difficult to make friends at university and find those groupings because it's not like the playground where people stand there and stand there. It's like, you know, you, <laughs> how, how do you find people? It might be that it's not the people on your course, it's people on other courses. Or So all of that, the pressure at points to make friends is hugely scary isn't it and sometimes it can take quite a while really and people need to you know, find their own space I think I, what I really liked the way you broke it down into was thinking about the spaces of friendship and all of those things because to me it 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 just re it re resonated so much with working with adults with learning disabilities you know one of the things that um, adults with learning disabilities often will say they want the most is friends often boyfriend girlfriend or friend and and it's almost like how, how do we enable that how do you plan for that and I think because social workers don't know how to plan for that they just don't plan it they just ignore it but actually that's the deepest wish and desire of the person that you're working with and it's that bit isn't it about what becomes important in a plan is what's measurable and what we can do so we don't write down friendship because in six months time it's going to be too difficult to measure that you know or to say oh yes you've done that three times so you know putting down something else becomes more important but actually you broke it down for us to think about how might we be able to facilitate that for people it might be about so when somebody says i want friends instead of saying yeah that's really important and then just ignoring it and moving on to something that's measurable you can break it down can't you into okay so we can look at the spaces that you can go to to meet friends we can look at the skills that you might need to develop friendships so you've broken it down into a way that i think we can begin to include it in planning so I think that was really helpful. It was a really, really helpful webinar. Dave has put his hand up. So I think Dave wanted to say something or did you want to say something? Yes, Dave? I, I did, if that's OK. Um, just because you there. just because you raised the point about university and um, there was a question asked in the chat about how do I make friends? And our very own Jenna made the point, try and get to know yourself first. And I think that took me until third year to realise that university isn't all about friendships. It isn't all about that. It's about getting to know yourself. And I think there's an important reflection there from Jenna, who's incredible, that it's important to take the time to get to know yourself and not put the pressure on yourself to make friends. Friends will come and they will be important friends that will come because it's not forced. Um, but getting to know yourself allows you to then attract the right people and not attract um, more negativity into your life because you've tried to force something. So I think that's a very important thing because you raised the point, Siobhan, that a lot of parents are like, this is the friends you'll make for life. It doesn't have to be, and you don't have to panic about that. And just take the time to know yourself, and those friends will eventually get there. So. Absolutely. Knowing yourself and liking yourself is so important, isn't it? And um, absolutely. Thank you for that, Dave. So we um, we need to start to draw things to a conclusion. Thank you so much again to Ruth and to Autumn. It was a fabulous webinar. It really, really has made me think a lot. So thank you for that. And uh, uh, really enjoyed that. So thank you. Because I you know, love thinking. Thinking makes us learn, doesn't it? And it's really made me think. And I know it'll make me think over the next few days. So thank you. 
So our very final session of uh, this season is next week. I think Dave will put the link in the chat now. We would love you to join us all. Um, we have our final session of every season. We've got into a bit of a pattern now and we do an A to Z. We've done an A to Z of theory, haven't we? We've done an A to Z of reflection. Uh, this time, next week, we are doing an A to Z of anti-oppressive practice, which I think is going to be really interesting. And actually, we really like to have all our, as many members of the community that join us in our webinars come to those A to Zs because you can add in your own A to Z. You can start thinking now, what is my A to Z of anti-oppressive practice? It's a really good activity, actually, for you to do. Great CPD, great piece of reflection for you to take into supervision if you're on placement and then compare it to our A to Z that we're going to develop as a team and we'll share with you next week and we also like it if you want to at the end of our final session next week we'll give the option for anybody who wants to to put their cameras on and wave to everybody at the end as we conclude our season and we'll tell you that now just in case because sometimes we say that and people go I wish I'd known I've still got my I've put my pajamas on I would have not had my pajamas on if I'd have known so we're telling you ahead of time at the end of next week, if you want to, we'll get everybody to put their cameras on and we can all wave at one another and begin to because we meet through the chat. And I feel like I know people. I took, some people come to training sessions with me. I go, oh, I know you from the webinars and things like that. We could begin to learn to get to know each other. So it's nice to see people's faces, which would be fabulous. So thank you ever so much once again to Ruth and Autumn. And uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week for our final session of the season season three thank you bye everyone bye